Chapter Thirty Nine of North and South. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne Howlett. North and South by Elizabeth Cleghorn Gaskell. Chapter Thirty Nine: Making Friends. Nay, I have done, you get no more of me, and I am glad, yea, glad with all my heart, that thus so clearly I myself am free. Drayton Margaret shut herself up in her own room after she had quitted Mrs. Thornton. She began to walk backwards and forwards in her old habitual way of showing agitation, but then remembering that in that slightly built house every step was heard from one room to another, she sat down until she heard Mrs. Thornton go safely out of the house. She forced herself to recollect all the conversation that had passed between them. Speech by speech, she compelled her memory to go through with it. At the end, she rose up and said to herself in a melancholy tone, At any rate, her words do not touch me. They fall off from me, for I am innocent of all the motives she attributes to me. But still it is hard to think that any one, any woman, can believe all this of another so easily. It is hard and sad. Where I have done wrong, she does not accuse me. She does not know. He never told her. I might have known he would not. She lifted up her head as if she took pride in any delicacy of feeling which Mr. Thornton had shown. Then, as a new thought came across her, she pressed her hands tightly together. He, too, must take poor Frederick for some lover. She blushed as the word passed through her mind. I see it now. It is not merely that he knows of my falsehood, but he believes that someone else cares for me, and that I... Oh dear, oh dear, what shall I do? What do I mean? Why do I care what he thinks, beyond the mere loss of his good opinion as regards my telling the truth or not? I cannot tell, but I am very miserable. Oh, how unhappy this last year has been! I have passed out of childhood into old age. I have had no youth, no womanhood. The hopes of womanhood have closed for me, for I shall never marry, and I anticipate cares and sorrows just as if I were an old woman, and with the same fearful spirit. I am weary of this continual call upon me for strength. I could bear up for papa, because that is a natural pious duty, and I think I could bear up against, at any rate, I could have the energy to resent, Mrs. Thornton's unjust, impertinent suspicions. But it is hard to feel how completely he must misunderstand me. What has happened to make me so morbid today? I do not know. I only know I cannot help it. I must give way sometimes. No, I will not, though, said she, springing to her feet. I will not, I will not think of myself in my own position. I won't examine into my own feelings. It would be of no use now. Sometime, if I live to be an old woman, I may sit over the fire and, looking into the embers, see the life that might have been. All this time she was hastily putting on her things to go out, only stopping from time to time to wipe her eyes with an impatience of gesture at the tears that would come in spite of all her bravery. I dare say there's many a woman makes as sad a mistake as I have done and only finds it out too late, and how proudly and impertinently I spoke to him that day. But I did not know then. It has come upon me little by little, and I don't know where it began. Now I won't give way. I shall find it difficult to behave in the same way to him with this miserable consciousness upon me. But I will be very calm and very quiet and say very little. But to be sure, I may not see him. He keeps out of our way, evidently. That would be worse than all, and yet no wonder that he avoids me, believing what he must about me. She went out, going rapidly towards the country and trying to drown reflection by swiftness of motion. As she stood on the doorstep at her return, her father came up. "'Good girl,' said he. "'You've been to Mrs. Boucher's. "'I was just meaning to go there if I had time before dinner.' "'No, Papa, I have not,' said Margaret, reddening. "'I never thought about her, but I will go directly after dinner. "'I will go while you are taking your nap.' "'Accordingly, Margaret went. "'Mrs. Boucher was very ill, really ill, not merely ailing. "'The kind and sensible neighbor who had come in the other day "'seemed to have taken charge of everything.' Some of the children were gone to the neighbors. Mary Higgins had come for the three youngest at dinner time, and since then Nicholas had gone for the doctor. He had not come as yet. Mrs. Boucher was dying, and there was nothing to do but to wait. Margaret thought that she should like to know his opinion, and that she could not do better than go and see the Higginses in the meantime. 
she might then possibly hear whether Nicholas had been able to make his application to Mr. Thornton. She found Nicholas busily engaged in making a penny spin on the dresser for the amusement of three little children who were clinging to him in a fearless manner. He, as well as they, was smiling at a good long spin, and Margaret thought that the happy look of interest in his occupation was a good sign. When the penny stopped spinning, little Johnny began to cry. "'Come to me,' said Margaret, taking him off the dresser and holding him in her arms. She held her watch to his ear while she asked Nicholas if he had seen Mr. Thornton. The look on his face changed instantly. "'Aye,' said he, "'I've seen and heard too much on him.' "'He refused you, then?' said Margaret sorrowfully. "'To be sure. I knew he'd do it all along. It's no good expecting mercy at the hands of them masters. You're a stranger and a foreigner and aren't likely to know their ways, but I knowed it. I am sorry I asked you. Was he angry? He did not speak to you as Hamper did, did he?' "'He weren't or civil,' said Nicholas, spinning the penny again, as much for his own amusement as for that of the children. "'Never you fret.' I'm only where I was. I'll go on tramp tomorrow. I gave him as good as I got. I told him I'd not that good opinion on him that I'd a come a second time of myself. But you'd advised me for to come, and I were beholden to you. You told him I sent you? I don't know if I called you by your name. I don't think I did. I said a woman who knew no better had advised for me to come and see if there was a soft place in his heart. And he? asked Margaret said I were to tell you to mind your own business. That's the longest spin yet, my lads, and them civil words to what he used to me. But never mind. We're but where we was, and I'll break stones on the road afore I let these little uns clem. Margaret put the struggling Johnny out of her arms, back into his former place on the dresser. I am sorry I asked you to go to Mr. Thornton's. I am disappointed in him. There was a slight noise behind her. Both she and Nicholas turned round at the same moment, and there stood Mr. Thornton, with a look of displeased surprise upon his face. Obeying her swift impulse, Margaret passed out before him, saying not a word, only bowing low to hide the sudden paleness that she felt had come over her face. He bent equally low in return, and then closed the door after her. As she hurried to Mrs. Boucher's, she heard the clang, and it seemed to fill up the measure of her mortification. He, too, was annoyed to find her there. He had tenderness in his heart, a soft place, as Nicholas Huggins called it, but he had some pride in concealing it. He kept it very sacred and safe, and was jealous of every circumstance that tried to gain admission. But if he dreaded exposure of his tenderness, he was equally desirous that all men should recognize his justice, and he felt that he had been unjust in giving so scornful a hearing to any one who had waited, with humble patience, for five hours to speak to him. That the man had spoken saucily to him when he had the opportunity was nothing to Mr. Thornton. He rather liked him for it, and he was conscious of his own irritability of temper at the time, which probably made them both quits. It was the five hours of waiting that struck Mr. Thornton. He had not five hours to spare himself, but one hour, two hours of his hard penetrating intellectual as well as bodily labor did he give up to going about collecting evidence as to the truth of Higgins' story, the nature of his character, the tenor of his life. He tried not to be, but was convinced that all that Higgins had said was true, and then the conviction went in, as if by some spell, and touched the latent tenderness of his heart, the patience of the man, the simple generosity of the motive, for he had learnt about the quarrel between Boucher and Higgins, made him forget entirely the mere reasonings of justice and overleap them by a diviner instinct. He came to tell Higgins he would give him work, and he was more annoyed to find Margaret there than by hearing her last words, for then he understood that she was the woman who had urged Higgins to come to him, and he dreaded the admission of any thought of her as a motive to what he was doing solely because it was right. "'So that was the lady you spoke of as a woman,' said he indignantly to Higgins. "'You might have told me who she was.' "'And then, maybe, you'd have spoken of her more civil than you did.' you getting a mother who might have your tongue in check when you are talking a woman being at the root of all the plagues. Of course you told that to Miss Hale. In course I did, leastwise I reckon I did. I told her she weren't to meddle again in aught that concerned you. Whose children are those? Yours? Mr. Thornton had a pretty good notion whose they were, from what he had heard, but he felt awkward in turning the conversation round from this unpromising beginning. They're not mine, and they are mine. They're the children you spoke of to me this morning. When you said, replied Higgins, turning round with ill-smothered fierceness, that my story might be true or might not, 
but it were a very unlikely one. Mr. I've not forgotten. Mr. Thornton was silent for a moment. Then he said, No more have I. I remember what I said. I spoke to you about those children in a way I had no business to do. I did not believe you. I could not have taken care of another man's children myself if he had acted towards me as I hear Boucher did towards you. But I know now that you spoke truth. I beg your pardon. Higgins did not turn round or immediately respond to this, but when he did it was in a softened tone, although the words were gruff enough. You have no business to go prying into what happened between Boucher and me. He's dead and I'm sorry. That's enough. So it is. Will you take work with me? That's what I came to ask. Higgins' obstinacy wavered, recovered strength and stood firm. He would not speak. Mr. Thornton would not ask again. Higgins's eye fell on the children. You've called me impudent and a liar and a mischief-maker, and you might have said with some truth as I were now and then given to drink. And I have called you a tyrant, and an owl bulldog, and a hard, cruel master. That's where it stands. But for the children, Maester, do you think we can e'er get on together? Well, said Mr. Thornton, half laughing, it was not my proposal that we should go together, but there's one comfort on your own showing. We neither of us can think much worse of the other than we do now. That's true, said Higgins reflectively. I've been thinking, ere since I saw you, what a mercy it were you did not take me on, for that I e'er saw a man whom I could less abide. But that's maybe been a hasty judgment, and works work to such as me. So, master, I'll come, and what's more, I thank you, and that's a deal from me, said he more frankly, suddenly turning round and facing Mr. Thornton fully for the first time. And this is a deal from me, said Mr. Thornton, giving Higgins' hand a good grip. Now mind you come sharp to your time, continued he, resuming the master. I'll have no laggards at my mill. What fines we have we keep pretty sharply, and the first time I catch you making mischief, off you go. So now you know where you are. You spoke of my wisdom this morning. I reckon I may bring it with me, or would you rather have me bout my brains? Bout your brains if you can use them for meddling with my business, with your brains if you can keep them to your own. I shall need a deal of brains to settle where my business ends and yours begins. Your business has not begun yet, and mine stands still for me, so good afternoon. Just before Mr. Thornton came up to Mrs. Boucher's door, Margaret came out of it. She did not see him, and he followed her for several yards, admiring her light and easy walk and her tall and graceful figure. But suddenly the simple emotion of pleasure was tainted, poisoned by jealousy. He wished to overtake her and speak to her, to see how she would receive him, now she must know he was aware of some other attachment. He wished, too, but of this wish he was rather ashamed, that she should know that he had justified her wisdom in sending Higgins to him to ask for work, and had repented of his morning's decision. He came up to her. She started. "'Allow me to say, Miss Hale, that you are rather premature in expressing your disappointment. I have taken Higgins on.' "'I am glad of it,' said she, coldly. "'He tells me,' he repeated to you, "'what I said this morning about—' Mr. Thornton hesitated. Margaret took it up. "'About women not meddling. You had a perfect right to express your opinion, which was a very correct one, I have no doubt. But,' she went on a little more eagerly, "'Higgins did not quite tell you the exact truth.' The word truth reminded her of her own untruth, and she stopped short, feeling exceedingly uncomfortable. Mr. Thornton at first was puzzled to account for her silence, and then he remembered the lie she had told, and all that was foregone. "'The exact truth,' said he. "'Very few people do speak the exact truth. I have given up hoping for it. Miss Hale, have you no explanation to give me? You must perceive what I cannot but think.' Margaret was silent. She was wondering whether an explanation of any kind would be consistent with her loyalty to Frederick. Nay, said he, I will ask no farther, and I may be putting temptation in your way. At present, believe me, your secret is safe with me, but you run great risks, allow me to say, in being so indiscreet. I am now only speaking as a friend of your father's. If I had any other thought or hope, of course, that is at an end. I am quite disinterested. I am aware of that, said Margaret, forcing herself to speak in an indifferent, careless way. I am aware of what I must appear to you, but the secret is another person's, and I cannot explain it without doing him harm. I have not the slightest wish to pry into the gentleman's secrets, he said with growing anger. My own interest in you is simply that of a friend. You may not believe me, Miss Hale, but it is, in spite of the persecution I'm afraid I threatened you with at one time, but that is all given up. 
all passed away. You believe me, Miss Hale? Yes, said Margaret, quietly and sadly. Then, really, I don't see any occasion for us to go on walking together. I thought perhaps you might have had something to say, but I see we are nothing to each other. If you're quite convinced that any foolish passion on my part is entirely over, I will wish you good afternoon. He walked off very hastily. What can he mean, thought Margaret? What can he mean by speaking so, as if I were always thinking that he cared for me, when I know he does not, he cannot? His mother will have said all those cruel things about me to him, but I won't care for him. I surely am mistress enough of myself to control this wild, strange, miserable feeling, which tempted me even to betray my own dear Frederick, so that I might but regain his good opinion, the good opinion of a man who takes such pains to tell me that I am nothing to him. Come, poor little heart, be cheery and brave. We'll be a great deal to one another if we are thrown off and left desolate." Her father was almost startled by her merriment this afternoon. She talked incessantly and forced her natural humor to an unusual pitch. And if there was a tinge of bitterness in much of what she said, if her accounts of the old Harley Street set were a little sarcastic, her father could not bear to check her, as he would have done at another time, for he was glad to see her shake off her cares. In the middle of the evening she was called down to speak to Mary Higgins, and when she came back Mr. Hale imagined that he saw traces of tears on her cheeks. But that could not be, for she brought good news, that Higgins had got work at Mr. Thornton's mill. Her spirits were damped, at any rate, and she found it very difficult to go on talking at all, much more in the wild way that she had done. For some days her spirits varied strangely, and her father was beginning to be anxious about her, when news arrived from one or two quarters that promised some change and variety for her. Mr. Hale received a letter from Mr. Bell, in which that gentleman volunteered a visit to them, and Mr. Hale imagined that the promised society of his old Oxford friend would give as agreeable a turn to Margaret's ideas as it did to his own. Margaret tried to take an interest in what pleased her father, but she was too languid to care about any Mr. Bell, even though he were twenty times her godfather. She was more roused by a letter from Edith, full of sympathy about her aunt's death, full of details about herself, her husband, and child, and at the end saying that as the climate did not suit the baby, and as Mrs. Shaw was talking of returning to England, she thought it probable that Captain Lennox might sell out, and that they might all go and live again in the old Harley Street house which, however, would seem very incomplete without Margaret. Margaret yearned after that old house and the placid tranquillity of that old, well-ordered, monotonous life. She had found it occasionally tiresome while it lasted, but since then she had been buffeted about and felt so exhausted by this recent struggle with herself that she thought that even stagnation would be a rest and a refreshment. So she began to look towards a long visit to the Lennoxes on their return to England, as to a point, no, not of hope, but of leisure in which she could regain her power and command over herself. At present it seemed to her as if all subjects tended towards Mr. Thornton, as if she could not forget him with all her endeavors. If she went to see the Higginses she heard of him there. Her father had resumed their readings together and quoted his opinions perpetually. Even Mr. Bell's visit brought his tenant's name upon the tapas, for he wrote word that he believed he must be occupied some great part of his time with Mr. Thornton as a new lease was in preparation, and the terms of it must be agreed upon. End of chapter 39 Recording by Leanne Howlett